It is not yet technically the 90s, but nevertheless, there is still time for clacks on Game Boy Works. We've seen a great portable adaptation of Atari Games' arcade puzzler Klax over an Atari Lynx on Game Boy Works Guide In. Now over here on Game Boy, surprisingly enough, there are two distinct versions of Klax, released a few months apart. This first release seems to embody that ad slogan Atari used for the game. It is the 90s and there is time for Klax. In the strictest, most technical sense, the 90s would begin on January 1st, 1991, and here, two weeks prior to that hallowed date, we have Hudson Soft's adaptation of the game. The first thing you will notice about this version of Klax is that it looks surprisingly plain. The second thing you will notice is that it is very definitely not the same version of Klax U, a person who statistically speaking in terms of this channel's viewership demographics did not grow up in Japan, will remember playing 30 years ago. Hudson's adaptation of Klax was distinct from the Tengen developed Mindscape produced version that shipped in the West several months later. This release only ever appeared in Japan, seemingly another in a fairly lengthy succession of Western games that saw visibly distinct conversions released exclusively for Japan. It's a trend that went back quite a ways here at the doorstep of the 90s to the likes of the SG-1000 port of Activision's Hero from 1985. The trend had become more common on Famicom thanks to that system's outsized influence in Japan. Once Kemco gave the Famicom its own unique, Japan-exclusive version of C64 military shooter Doughboy, the platform was off to the races. Famicom fans enjoyed, or at least played, unique Japan-only versions of American hits like Ball Blazer, which we've seen recently on NES Works Guide In, Macintosh classic Shuffle Puck Cafe, and even a wildly different and deeply inferior rendition of Maniac Mansion. At first glance, Hudson's take on Klax looks to continue the Maniac Mansion trend. It looks, shall we say, underwhelming. A big part of Klax's appeal came from its dynamic presentation. Atari artist Mark Stephen Pierce drew Klax's tile delivery rail with a three-dimensional quality, with the rail vanishing into the distance and tiles growing in size as they flipped their way toward the active play space. Besides looking stylish and cool, the visual perspective on the rail allowed players to see multiple tiles in the queue simultaneously, well before they reached the forward edge of the play space to drop into the void. Klax, like so many puzzlers, involves lining up three tiles of the same color to create matches, and the ability to take in so many arriving tiles at once allows a skilled player to think a few steps ahead to create complex chain combinations. The Hudson release does not look that cool. It abandons the vanishing visual perspective in favor of a boring, top-down viewpoint that renders the entire rail system as a rigid grid filled with straight lines and 90-degree angles. The vibrant backgrounds and exciting feel of the arcade game shift to a button-down perspective here, stayed and perfunctory. Hudson really dropped the ball here, totally failing to deliver on the essence of Atari's classic and causing a tremendous embarrassment to the nation of Japan as a whole, this is what I'd say if I were a complete idiot. In reality, Hudson's creative decision here to dial back the dazzle was the best possible choice they could have made with Klax. And in point of fact, their Game Boy adaptation turned out to be much more playable than Atari's own conversion under the Tengen name. I'm a little torn on how to cover Tengen's Game Boy Klax, since it technically is a wholly distinct game released several months later. But I don't think the effectiveness of Hudson's work really comes through without Tengen's as an object lesson for comparison and contrast. There's good Klax, and then there's the, well, it was a nice effort, Klax. The problem, of course, is that Atari built the original arcade Klax around a very different sort of screen technology than Game Boys, namely colorful, high-resolution screens. With the Lynx version, Atari and Tengen took advantage of that system's unique interface design by asking players to turn the handheld sideways and effectively create a Tate mode experience. While some of the background art had to be cropped as a result of the rotated setup, the actual playfield suffered only a moderate amount of pixel data loss, despite shifting to the decidedly low-resolution screen of the Lynx. On top of that, Lynx had, you know, a color screen. For the Game Boy port of Klax, sadly, neither of those options were available. Klax's tiles appear in roughly half a dozen different colors, whereas Game Boy's screen could display four shades of sickly greenish gray. For Klax to function on Nintendo's handheld, some creative license was clearly in order. Both Hudson and Tengen took a page from Koei's book, seen in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, 
and replaced the original solid colors of the arcade playing pieces with monochromatic patterns. That approach worked well for depicting different map territories in Koei's slow-paced strategy game, but in a zippy puzzler based entirely around quickly identifying and arranging moving objects by color, this was a much trickier prospect. In the Western release, Clax for Game Boy's insistence on arcade fidelity works heavily against the game. Its reproduction of Clax's trademark dramatic vanishing point perspective certainly does look impressive on Game Boy, but it renders the actual moment-to-moment -moment action borderline unplayable. Where the puzzle pieces in the arcade and full-color home conversions read clearly to the eye the moment they first appear on the distant horizon, that's not the case on Game Boy. Stripped of distinctive colors and forced to rely on a handful of largely identical patterns, Mindscape's clax amounts to a near indecipherable blur of pixels. And that's even the case when you don't play, on the only Game Boy screens available at the time of this version's debut, the dim and smeary original model. Several tiles are difficult to distinguish from one another until they've nearly reached the front line, giving players little time to react before they fall. And even then, the stacks of tiles that accumulate at the bottom of the well don't read well with your peripheral vision, a fundamental pillar of Klax's game design. Rather than being able to train your attention on the arriving blocks while scanning the growing block pile below out of the corner of your eye, Mindscape's design requires you to constantly shift your active focus from the playfield to the well and back again which of course makes it even harder to parse the arriving blocks in time to make optimal use of them. The Hudson version fares much better. While it obviously had to work within the same color constraints as the Mindscape release, Hudson's boring, stripped-down approach to visuals makes for a more functional game. Hudson's block pattern designs read more clearly than the ones Tengen crafted, and with no 3D perspective or vanishing point to account for, the blocks maintain a consistent size from the moment they appear at the top of the screen until they drop off the front edge of the rail. The result may amount to a less visually interesting setup, but as a game, it works vastly better than, ironically enough, Tengen's handling of their own creation. This seems to have been a case where the external studio's distance from the original work allowed them to take a more dispassionate approach to the conversion, abandoning the game's trademark sense of cool in favor of something that, while less exciting to look at, ended up being a whole lot more enjoyable to play. Of course, neither version can hold a candle to the Lynx port of the game, which didn't accommodate the limitations of portable hardware so much as capitalize on their potential, making it a rare victory for Lynx. At the opposite end of victory from Clax for Lynx, we have Hot Bee's Card and Puzzle Collection Ginga. That's not me being descriptive here, this is actually the title of the game, Card and Puzzle Collection Ginga. In Japanese, Ginga means galaxy which suggests something far more exciting than what Hot Bee actually drummed up here. Rather than being some sort of cosmic-themed puzzler along the lines of, say, Medios, Ginga is simply a collection of a dozen solitaire-style card games. While some of these games work more or less as you'd expect, lots of solitaire variants, and there's even a sliding number puzzle, the rest come across as pretty opaque. Ginga groups its dozen games into three sets of four. Games based on Mahjong tiles, games based on the Western 52 card deck, and games based on other. Not to put too fine a point on it, but Ginga essentially amounts to a collection of digitized meat-spaced time killers of the variety that video games were supposed to render obsolete. Hit. Yeah. I hit. You have sunk my battleship. This game triggers my childhood memories of summer vacations in the 1980s, spent at my grandparents' home, trying to eke enjoyment out of their random collection of board and marble games with my siblings, or watching the adults play gin rummy. The moment console and portable games came into my life, these old traditional time wasters found themselves immediately remanded to the basement storage bin, never to be thought of again. And yet here are the galaxy brains at Hot B, harnessing the liberating power of Game Boy to give people the power to play a small selection of games that they could already experience with a $2 deck of cards. I realize I'm being a little unfair. Obviously it's difficult to set up a deck to play solitaire in the backseat of a car or on the tray table of an airplane. But still, this collection does not spark joy. It's just a bland, to the point collection of traditional games with no competitive mode and, frustratingly, no in game pointer for how these things are to be played. Inga offers no explanation for its dozen diversions beyond a name. Hotbee also didn't bother to include any sort of fail state detection, so the only way to know you've lost a hand is that none of your attempts to make a move work anymore. I mean, I could do that myself with a bicycle deck. Surely they could have put that zippy 4 MHz Z80 chip to better use. The lack of in-game guidance is especially frustrating for the first set of minigames, which are based around Mahjong tiles. 
These games all have rules that don't make much sense going in blind, and names that don't easily make for insightful instruction search results. Look up Ghost Mahjong, for example, and you'll get a lot of creepypasta about haunted tiles and the like. Pressure Mahjong just gets you commentary about how intense Mahjong can be. Not really useful. The Mahjong-based games here all involve making matches and connections with the different tile values and suits, but we're a long way from Shanghai here. No simple tile matching to be found, instead making matches causes unintuitive side effects to play out. For example, in Ghost, flipping a tile causes that tile to be removed from play, but depending on the tile you flip, various other tiles on the board will also flip. The effect seems to vary not only by the tile and suit, but also by its location on the board. Your goal is clearly to flip all the tiles, but it's difficult to make that work without having some clear explanation of flip patterns. Similarly, pressure seems almost like Shanghai, in that you're making matches along the edges of a board, but it also doesn't have a particularly intuitive rule set. When you match tiles, other tiles will also be removed from play, and at the same time, the tiles along the perimeter get switched around in an unintuitive way. Then there's race, in which you try to flip as many adjacent tiles as possible before the entire board is taken out of play. Again, I'm at a loss for which matches are allowed, and why turning certain tiles causes the entire board to flip. And finally, there's a ray in which you simply lay out mahjong tiles on a grid. Placing tiles of identical suits and value in adjacent spaces causes them to be cleared away, which is logical enough. Also, the wind tiles move around on their own and don't vanish unless you line them up in special ways. When you place the north tile, it causes every tile in that line to move one space north. Likewise, the west tile, and east and south. At least the 52 card solitaire variants are simple enough. Golf, for example, is so intuitive that it's actually the only game mode I could find reference footage for on both Western and Japanese video sites like YouTube and Nico Nico. It's a straightforward card match solitaire in which you try to clear away cards by placing one on the deck when a card of consecutive value appears. You can make these matches in either direction, which is to say you can pull a four or a six when the active card is a five requiring you to consider your moves more tactically than in standard Klondike. Nestor sees you making matches of cards with identical numeric values on stacks. You can match the bottommost cards on each stack, or you can pull from the five reserve cards along the bottom. The reserve is not replenished once used, making it a resource to be applied sparingly. You also have two wild joker cards which can come in handy, but again should only be used when absolutely necessary. In Pyramid, you need to match pairs of cards that add up to 13. Here, Ace has a value of 1, and King has a value of 13, meaning it can be played without a match. And then there's Double, which... hell if I know. Searches for Double Solitaire just bring up explanations of two-player and two-deck solitaire games, which, that's not what this is. And last of all, you have the toy-style game simulators. 15 Puzzle is simply a sliding block puzzle as seen in popular role-playing games of the era. Solitaire is a so-called Chinese checkers variant in which you attempt to jump marbles over one another into empty slots on a cross-shaped board. Knight takes place on a traditional chessboard and requires you to clear out a pawn from every square by taking them with legal knight moves. And change involves illustrated tiles of military vehicles, which I actually don't understand. And that's it. That's all there is to Ginga, Clubhouse Games the Saint. Ginga appears to be a Game Boy port of a system soft creation by the same name for MSX computers. I guess we can therefore blame system soft for how boring and bare bones this whole thing is. I think even Hot B knew it had a dud here. The game gives you a language prompt when you first start up play in either Japanese or English, and if you select English, your title screen changes, as does the title. Ginga becomes the bizarrely named Tornado Appetizer. What I can tell, Hot B actively worked toward an American release for Ginga under that alternate title. Not only did they program the variant title screen, an internet search reveals the fact that they also registered the trademark. Thankfully, sanity prevailed, and the company decided not to try to sell American children a humdrum collection of solitaire amusements under an absolutely baffling alternate moniker. Anyway, we're about as far into the weeds here as Game Boy gets. Like the infamous card game, Ginga, or is that Tornado Appetizer, flew so far beneath the radar that this video, from what I can tell, is now the definitive retrospective treatise on the game on the entire internet. Yeah, you can put that on my headstone, baby.
Next time on Game Boy Works, Screonk. <laughs>